This is the 11th meeting of criminal law. In this video, we begin our study of the homicide offenses. We will identify their elements and apply what we have learned about mens rea to understand how the different homicide offenses have come to be graded. By grading, I mean separating and assigning a greater or lesser punishment. The criminal law makes distinctions between the homicide offenses by looking to the state of mind of the accused. In general, the worse the mens rea, the more serious the crime and the harsher the punishment. I've been speaking of the homicide offenses. This raises a question. Should all homicides be punished? Homicide is defined as a killing of a person by a person. Suicide is homicide under this definition, but we set that to one side. We know that fatal accidents can happen, and no one seems to be blamable even where we can identify a person whose action caused another person to die. We will want to insist that only culpable homicides are punished. This raises another question. Should all punishable homicides be punished the same way? At early common law in England, criminal homicide was punished by hanging the offender by the neck until dead. That struck the Crown's judges as too harsh in some cases, for the judges recognized that even among the blamable killings, a subset of those killings was noticeably worse than others. Rather than hang them all and let God sort them out, the judges sought to draw a line within the category of blameworthy homicides, and they assigned labels to these two subcategories. The less bad kind of culpable homicide they called manslaughter, and the worst kind they called murder. Homicides that were not culpable enough to justify punishing at all were called death by misadventure. The distinction between the two kinds of punishable homicide, murder and manslaughter, would have no real point unless different punishments were assigned to them, as indeed there were. Murder was punished by death, or later maybe by life imprisonment. And manslaughter was punishable by confinement for a term of years in excess of one year, as a felony in other words. We will not worry about the precise sentences assigned to the various homicide offenses. What matters for our purposes is that the law of homicide draws a line between bad and worse and reserves the heavier punishments for the worse homicides. I hope that makes sense to you. But how does the criminal law draw the line between murder and manslaughter? The principle of proportionality makes us want to draw a line, and the principle of legality insists that the line be as clear as possible. The traditional answer appeals to the kind of culpability the prosecution proves. Murder is unlawful killing with something called malice aforethought. Manslaughter is unlawful killing without that something called malice aforethought. The distinction is drawn succinctly in the report of the UK Royal Commission. Homicide is the killing of a human being by a human being. Murder is unlawful killing with malice aforethought. Manslaughter is unlawful killing without malice of forethought. With or without this mental element, malice of forethought, this mental element that justifies hanging a killer, what is it? The eminent Victorian jurist Sir James Fitzjames Stephen offered a wry explanation of the origin of the expression 
malice aforethought. The judges called it malice or not, according to their view of the propriety of hanging particular people. Over centuries of experience, this subjective case-by-case -case approach crystallized into certain definite objective rules. It is murder if one person kills another with intent to do so. It is murder if one person is killed by an act intended to kill another, or someone but no one in particular. It is murder if death results from an act intended to do grievous bodily harm. And finally, it is murder if one person kills another by an intentional act which he knows to be likely to cause grievous bodily harm, though the actor be recklessly indifferent as to the results. In other words, a defendant may be convicted of murder even in case he did not mean to do serious harm to another and hope not to do serious harm. This last situation is illustrated by the case of Gray. Gray was a blacksmith who grew frustrated with his apprentice. To get the apprentice's attention, Gray gave him a tap on the head, maybe only a wake-up call. Sadly, the master blacksmith misjudged, and his apprentice never woke up again. Gray was hanged. His act was reckless as to the risk of serious bodily harm, and as a result, the apprentice died. It was murder. But in Gray's case, was there malice? The doctrine is indifferent to malice in the sense of ill will. For all that appears, Gray may have had the tenderest affection for his apprentice all along. And where's the evidence of forethought? Gray seems to have acted on the spur of the moment's frustration with his contrary helper. The answer is that neither malice nor forethought are essential to malice of forethought. It is what linguists call a fused idiom. It is a term whose component words make no real contribution to its meaning. Say it fast enough, malice of forethought, and you get the idea. Our next video will carry us further into our study of the elements of murder.